Yes, uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, this is a presentation on my summer project uh, that happened in around August 2020. So where I worked under my professor uh, Eileen Aldrich. So the project involves uh, uh, so the goal of the project uh, involved uh, trying to trade based on the text present in SEC filings, essentially the MD and A section of SEC filings. Uh, so Every day, these companies publish uh, up to four uh, reports. They're, they're required to publish four reports, uh, one 10K and three 10Q filings. And they all have this MDNA section. Like everybody looks at uh, the fundamental, like the quantitative numbers, they derive financial ratios from it, but uh, the text is largely ignored. Uh, but because of these advent of new NLP techniques, uh, we're able to uh, utilize the algorithms to find a sentiment of this text, find a score around this text. So the objective is to trade based on the text in the MDNA section. And why would we like to do that? Well, because uh, because time, uh, yeah, a human could read the MDNA section and go make a prediction, but you would need a lot of human hours to do that for all the stocks present in the US market. So something that uh, does this in a systematic way quickly uh, would be very helpful. Now, uh, coming to the data, what I worked on. So I managed to uh, have a clean data set of uh, 430 stocks point in time uh, and my time period involved uh, from I wanted to include uh, both the financial crashes so I started my time series uh, started my data set from 2007 January to 2020 August and uh, the filing types were uh, I was looking at were 10 Ks and 10 Q reports now my strategy was uh, to somehow figure out a score for each of the report that is published by these uh, stocks and analyze the performance of the stocks after filtering them into five quantiles based on the score and try to create a long shot strategy, see how, uh, how they're performing in each of these quantiles. So the fundamental problems now comes down to figuring out a score for these reports. So there are a lot of ways to figure out a score for a particular report. You could do a comparison based score, like uh, just find out how much is the change in length of the text uh, relative to the previous filing and how much is the similarity of the text with, uh, with the respect to previous filing. Uh, other than that, you can also uh, so these are like analogous to the uh, traditional methods that Nicholas was talking about. And uh, then you can use a sentiment based scores where you have a certain defined lexicon, defined dictionary, where you find out uh, what are the positive words, what are the negative words, neutral words. And uh, another way you can do is use deep learning and try to figure out what's the sentiment of the paragraph itself. So today I'll be looking at two of these methods. I'll be going through two of these methods. So for my project, like mostly for text similarity, what I did was uh, once you quickly uh, like uh, vectorize the document, uh, I used a simple DF-IDF transformation. And once you uh, vectorize the document, uh, you could find similarity score uh, using uh, these two uh, methods called cosine similarity and jacquard similarity. Now cosine similarity is simply just the dot product of these vectors normalized. Uh, uh, so you get a score between zero and one for the similarity. After you find that similarity score, uh, you can split the stocks in your universe into quantiles and look at the performance of each quantile uh, throughout the history. And I did that with the cosine and jacquard similarity. And you can notice here that uh, uh, with cosine similarity, I noticed that uh, the performance that I'm able to achieve with these quantiles is very high, but there's a lot of risk involved. Uh, the, the, the quantiles performance is, looks very risky. And they're not able to distinguish between quantiles as well consistently throughout the time period. Whereas when I used the Jacquard similarity, uh, the, I was able to figure out a, a consistent uh, difference in quantiles. And uh, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, stocks, which are in the zero and the five bucket, which are essentially the extreme quantiles where the similarity of the document is higher and, and higher, uh, like most similar with the previous document, and uh, in the quantile where the document is uh, least similar with the previous document, you notice that the performance is a little bit higher, uh, which uh, which which tells us something about the that there is some information with uh, how companies are changing their uh, SEC filing with respect to the previous filing, uh, and that uh, there have been many researches going on with there have been many factors similar to that that I've noticed, and I've linked some of those papers in. Uh, Previously, to levy prices. Uh, now, now this is this is very simple. This is this this involves traditional methods. But uh, what about deep learning? Uh, 
So we can use RNNs essentially to find the sentiment of the text. So if you have something like uh, there was a great movie as input, you essentially just vectorize the text. You just give them tokens initially, but then this is a very important step in NLP where you figure out the embeddings of the words uh, to try to, uh, which you can further use into any of the deep learning models that you wish to do. So you figure out the embeddings, essentially uh, reducing the high dimensional space of all the the number of unique words in the document to something that is that can, like each word can be represented in a let's say a 32 length vector instead of a 500 length vector. Uh, using if you use one hot encoding, essentially you're you'll get a like number of unique uh, words length vector. But instead of that, you can use embedding, reduce the dimensional space, and then uh, input input them as as a sequence uh, similar to the architecture that Nicholas showed for RNNs use using bidirectional models, and then uh, you can input a dense layer after that to convert the, uh, basically using an activation function like sigmoid to convert it into a, to get a result of zero or one, essentially like logistic regression. So I just prepared a, a notebook where uh, I would like to, I would like to take you guys through. Uh, it's essentially just like a starter code for somebody who's starting out with RNNs and would like to apply it on text data. So. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through IMDb reviews and I'm trying to see uh, I'm trying to see what's the sentiment if, I, if we can cl classify these uh, the reviews uh, properly uh, based on the labels. So we have this data set available in Keras called IMDb. Uh, they have the they have cleaned and tokenized uh, the words and uh, it's uh, I do recommend to check it out. So here I'm just loading. Uh, my data set. I'm making sure that I'm only I'm on, I'll only be looking at far, top, the top most 5,000 used words in the reviews. Everything else is going to be just uh, let's say just masked over. Uh, we're not going to look at those words. But you can include all the words that are present in the dictionary for your for your problem. Uh, once you load the data set, like each review is tokenized like this. Like this is an example of one review, and uh, you have a mapping available uh, where each word is given a separate number. So if I were to decode this review, it would come uh, down to something like this. So this film was just brilliant casting location scenery, something of that sorts. So and we have a label uh, uh, in our train and test data set, so we can we can see if uh, our model can predict well. So what you would do is uh, essentially most of the reviews were between uh, zero to two thousand five hundred words, but most of them were between zero to five hundred words. And uh, an important step in neural nets is you would like the each of the sequences to have the same length. So we'll, I'm trying to stick to 500 lengths, 500 words essentially. So any review longer than 500 words is limited to 500 and every any review less than 500 words is padded with zeros to make sure that it is also 500 of 500 length. So once we pre-process the text and uh, we, uh, we build an embedding layer, uh, an LSTM layer and a dense layer, sigmoid layer to classify the, uh, to get a classification, to get a zero or one essentially. Uh, I, this is this will be the architecture of our RNN. This is the core of our RNN essentially, and uh, we compile the model. We uh, specify a loss metric that we're looking into. We specify a scoring metric that we're looking into. We're essentially looking at accuracy here, and uh, I train uh, the uh, RNN over our 25,000 training samples and uh, tested them over our 20 again another 25,000 testing samples and. Uh, uh, we were man I managed to achieve a, like this is a very basic RNN and I managed to achieve an accuracy of around 87.5. Uh, you can do you can use this similar setup for any of the text uh, data sets that you have. So here I created some examples just to see if if I throw at some new uh, text how it's going to perform. So the, like look at these three reviews like the movie is all right. We'll definitely watch it again. Uh, utterly boring character development needs some work. And review three, this was a great movie. If I were to input all of these sentences uh, after encoding them properly, pre-processing them properly and input it to the RNN, uh, these are some of the results that it would give. So these are the predictions. Essentially anything above 0 0.5 is one, anything above below 0 0.5 is zero, similar to logistic regression. So if you look at here, uh, the review one and three are classified well, like into the one category, which means they are positive reviews, which, which rings true. And the second review is not uh, given a great score because uh, the review is bad. So it, it did manage to learn English language essentially. And uh, this can be a good starter code for somebody 
who would like to apply uh, RNNs to text data. Yeah. And also, uh, uh, it would be very interesting to apply TCNs as well, uh, now that uh, we know of their power. Mm. And in conclusion to my talk, I would like to just uh, mention a few points. Uh, let me go back to my presentation. So in conclusion, I would just like to say that the, there's a lot of information available for text data uh, through these 10Ks and 10Qs. You can develop a lot of factors uh, and especially the factors which uh, utilize the previous document as well, instead of just focusing on the present document, do work well. And uh, apart from that, if you're looking into alternatives, other alternatives like using deep learning, there are many kinds of embeddings available. So that, that is some of the challenge when it comes to NLP, there's GLOW, there's word to doc there's BERT, there are RNNs. So there, is a, there are a lot of choices that you have similar to the leaderboard problem the, and most of them are said to perform well. So you, you need to uh, learn and figure out which one to use for your problem. And uh, apart from that, there's again, when it comes to more information, you can use more 8K filings or news articles uh, to incorporate more information and more data to uh, have more data to essentially train your network over since you would require them. So that, that can be some idea of future, future work for somebody who wants to get into uh, NLP and text uh, mining. So uh, I hope this is helpful for you guys. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Would like to take in questions if you guys have. Yeah. Thanks, Benil. Yeah, we have a few, uh, a few new questions uh, regarding your flash talk. Um, the first one is, were the 430 stocks picked at random? And I guess just as a follow-up, uh, because the performance looks uh, well, in, in this, since 2007, apparently the S&P 500 returned 300%, while this model does a lot more. So is there some kind of uh, maybe selection bias or? So there, I, I, I would say that there is some selection bias because I, I only picked stocks where, which were present in the index from 2007 to 2020. So essentially they were already well-performing stocks uh, over time. Uh, my only goal was to figure out if I can split them into buckets and notice some difference between the long and short buckets. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely some selection bias. And uh, there's also, uh, I've also had to leave a lot of stocks essentially because uh, they have not published their uh, 10Ks and 10Qs properly, or I could not extract the MDNA section because a lot of, because due to the regex functions and uh, due to the different formatting that these companies follow. It might also be the case that like, okay, it's so the companies which don't follow that best practices were maybe bad. So it, that, that way I was able to uh, eliminate all the, uh, you know, uh, not well-functioning companies essentially. So that might also be one of the reasons. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question for you. Can you um, elaborate on the numbers? Uh, or, uh, did you use any random simulation? in uh in your procedure randomness uh when it comes to randomness uh, no i don't i don't think there's any randomness when it comes to this no okay um so and another question which data vendor was behind the 10q and 10k oh. or are they real time or lagged no the that that is the soul of the project essentially i uh, web scraped these 10ks and 10qs through at the edgar website so that is the most that is like half half of the work that went into the project. So yeah, that is my own uh, work. Uh, I, I provided the GitHub link where you, if you if you give a CIK, essentially the uh, CIK related to any of the stock, you can you can you'll be uh, you can download a data frame with the with the filing type and the uh, MDNA section of it. Uh, and if you are able to like uh, uh, change the code a little bit, maybe you can uh, you can you can uh, extract other sections as well. So do look into that. Yeah. Okay, great. And, and I have a, uh, maybe a final question is, uh, so you, when you were looking at these, uh, these sort of uh, five, deci five quintiles and comparing them, is, what is the performance metric? Are we, what, what do we consider, uh, you know, for example, I noticed that the ones that do better uh, also are more volatile. So mm. it, have you, have you thought of, you know, uh, ways of uh, scoring these or uh, can, like where? I was, so essentially to see if a, one factor is better than the other, uh, you want, uh, we want to look at like the performance 
of each of these quantiles. So one scoring metric I initially looked at as information uh, coefficient. So essentially the correlation of the factors with the future returns and how consistent are they over time? Because even, even if the total performs like at the final, if the end of the day, quantile one performed better and quantile five performed, did not perform well, but is, it, is that the case consistently over the years? That is something I, that I've looked at to ensure that this is a this is a factor that you can invest in going forward. Mm -hmm. So just the information correlation is an important factor, I think, when you're looking at if a factor is working or not. Uh, uh, I've done this, like I would like these. This is the same thing that I would do with a standard factor like you know, momentum or value, any of these as well. Information correlation, I think, is a very important factor. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought it was very interesting how uh, if a management, uh, you know text section is exactly the same as the previous mm. one, which is like a very similar mm. uh, text, it could mean two things. Either this company is so stable and so healthy that it just has good news yep. all the time, or it could be that uh, the manager is just doing a cut and paste job and, and, and the similarity is being detected and really nobody's doing any work in this company. So. So it, I find that, and interestingly, that's, that's how the one of, or, or the, this quintile was the one that performed the best, but also had the highest volatility. Um, so I, I thought there was something interesting there and, and maybe something promising. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, like that was an idea I got through the Levy Prizes paper, but yes, uh, people have noticed that companies who were much more stable in their reporting, uh, 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 reporting uh, needs like which are like how publisher reports super, like periodically perfectly and have clearly defined sections like even things like this uh, the pumpleys which stick through them uh, do perform really well so that's probably a good factor to explore yeah. okay well uh, thank you both of you we've gone a little bit over time but uh, thanks uh, you know our I think we had a very interested crowd and, and um, so I wish you all a great summer and I look forward to seeing you again uh, in the fall um, and, um, and uh, thank you for this great presentation. <laughs>